Mm -hmm. He ready to go after I draw your blood, Mr. Sinclair. Mm -hmm. He ready to go after I draw your blood. I ready to die. <laughs> Anderson Sinclair is one of the few remaining survivors of the Tuskegee study. As many as 100 of the participants are thought to have died of their untreated syphilis. Sinclair and the other survivors now receive free health care for the rest of their lives, paid for by the U.S. government. But the experiment in which he took part continues to haunt the American medical establishment. Five minutes, okay? Got it. Relax your fist. For seven years, I went around trying to throw the story over the transom of some newspaper reporter or some television person who would talk about it, who would make some inquiry at least. I talked to law professors, I talked to friends who were reporters. I was unable to get anyone interested until the second time I told a friend who was a reporter over dinner what I knew. And she, by then, knew me well enough to think about it. Are you sure? Uh, did, did this happen? I mean, how do you know it happened? Do you have any documentation? I said, yes, I've got this much documentation on it. I mean, Xeroxes are the actual reports, where they were published, the dates and everything. She asked to see it, and that was the end of the silence. <laughs> In 1932, 400 black men in Alabama were screened out and offered free medical treatment for what they were told was bad blood. In fact, they had syphilis, and the government wanted to see what happens when syphilis goes untreated. Did they tell you you had syphilis? Nothing like that. Do that, draw my blood. We'll see you next time. That's it. That's it. The men had no idea they were being used as guinea pigs in an experiment designed to follow them to their deaths. Immediately after the story broke in 1972, a congressional investigation began. The first decision was to stop the experiment. But no one was ever prosecuted. No doctor was ever reprimanded. And to this day, the U.S. government has refused to condemn the experiment. I have now strong feelings that more should have been done and that perhaps we should have had an American Nuremberg tile uh, of the conduct of the Tuskegee experiment. We have no compunction about sending our youth away to war when it's in the national interest. And uh, in terms of syphilis was the leading cause of infant maternal mortality, leading single cause of admission to mental hospitals, and many other things. So it was in the national interest to uh, get the information so that you could provide the greatest protection for the entire community, black and white. Last year, over 60,000 babies were born with syphilis. And in the United States alone, more than a million syphilis cases were reported. Only a small fraction of these cases ever completed treatment. The Tuskegee study began with the best intentions. For federal health officials, syphilis was a national emergency. They went through the South doing blood surveys, and they were just appalled at the number of positives they had. It was an epidemic. I mean, it was much like, well, I hate to use the term AIDS because, but it, it spread like wildfire and they, they were surprised to find how many positives they had. The surveys were performed by mobile units of the U.S. Public Health Service in the late 1920s and partially financed by a private foundation called the Rosenwald Fund. But the treatment at that time, injections of arsenic and bismuth, was unreliable and expensive 
After the Depression began in 1930, the Rosenwald Fund could no longer pay for the second part of the project, bringing treatment to the infected rural population. The Public Health Service planned to cancel the project, but Dr. Tolliver Clark, director of the Venereal Disease Division, wanted to salvage something from the work done so far. He designed a short-term study to observe the natural course of untreated syphilis in black men. You couldn't get a group of people with that high incidence of positive serologies uh, in the whites like we had here and, and that was so isolated and was so ideally suited for the type of follow-up we wanted. It was just an accident that that little hunk of Tuskegee was, was available, but I don't think it was racist. At the time, it was thought that blacks reacted to the disease differently than whites. Clark and his colleagues believed that over six months or a year, the study would help them develop a more effective cure. The place chosen for the experiment was the rural area around the town of Tuskegee in Macon County, Alabama. The area had one of the highest rates of syphilis in the country. This also reinforced the opinion of many doctors that syphilis was a black disease. Its prevalence in the black community was often held up as proof of physical and moral inferiority. White doctors in the 1920s uh, were on a crusade. They felt that syphilis was rampant in the black community. Uh, their estimates would run as high as 95% of all blacks are syphilitic. Uh, they saw uh, in syphilis in the black community a threat to the white community because they feared that maids would come in and infect people or that barbers would infect them. So uh, they made uh, syphilis uh, a kind of holy war of theirs in the 1920s. Do you have any idea why it is more prevalent among the black community? Yeah, they, they, they're not as cautious. Uh, about it, and, uh, and when you when you get a bunch of people who don't have much else, they do an awful lot of fornicating, and this is one of the, one of their things. And they don't they don't have the knowledge and the information that some of the white people have about protection and whatnot. They didn't then, and they even now they don't have it as well as some white people do. Bad blood will return in a moment here on A&E. The doctors in charge of the Tuskegee syphilis study wanted to see the effects of unchecked syphilis in their human guinea pigs. So it was essential that the subjects not know that they were infected. In autumn 1932, leaflets were circulated among the black population in Macon County, inviting people to come for free treatment. In fact, they were given none. Instead, blood tests were taken and 400 black men with syphilis were recruited to the study. A local nurse, Eunice Rivers, was hired to bring the men in for their periodic examinations. We knew, and all the doctors knew, in, the, in this area, that uh, these people were not supposed to have gotten any treatment. Now, the doctors would have, um, maybe a patient had was uh, complaining of some other something else. They always had a little package in there car in their bags that they would give this patient you know well now they always gave uh, gave out that pink medicine didn't they? yeah oh they just love that pink medicine pink and medicine I, with pink aspirin yes mm -hmm. just help with, help with everyday pains. everyday pain see right. this is true she was very nice and friendly they had a lot of fun but she was very nice did you trust her Trust. Yeah, I had a lot of confidence in her. She would be. Well, you couldn't buy medicine. You couldn't get a doctor. And you meant you get you get free free medicine. That's what we, we signed up to get free medicine. Medicine wouldn't cost anything. And they gave everybody a thing about it. I, I, I look like me. I should have woke up before I did. The thing about it, you know, everybody didn't have the same complaint, but everybody got the same medicine, same liquid, and uh, the same pills, and the same capsules. Instead of treatment for syphilis, the men were given aspirins and tonics. They were told this would cure them. 
Anderson Sinclair is one of the few living survivors of the experiment. He is 87 years old. In 1932, he and the other men recruited for the study were in the latent stages of syphilis, a non-infectious period when there are no visible symptoms. The sons and grandsons of slaves, and barely educated, the men were unaware that over a period of years the disease attacks and destroys the internal organs of the body, particularly the heart, the brain, and the spinal cord. Without treatment, the majority would develop terrible late complications and many would eventually die of the disease. They were pitiful. And I recall one man, I've forgotten what his name is now, but that had all of his chest, one side eroded. That's what the doctors told me it was. And that uh, we would, he had these attacks quite often and I'd go running, bring him in. They had told me in one of the studies, don't let him die at home. Bring him in so we can open him up and see. And he lived about two years with this thing. Nobody knew what we what were being treated for. I was with it from start to finish. And lived through it, thank God. And I never, I never miss a point, I never miss a date. I really don't know what made them do it. But I, I, I just assumed they did it because they were in authority and they had that power to do what they did. Carter Howard was 26 and a sharecropper when he joined the study. We were glad to get it any time we thought would help us. I know I did. <laughs> we thought we'd get something free. That's why we joined the band. <laughs> they did not understand what syphilis was. And all diseases were, a lot of diseases were categorized in a term called bad blood. In other words, anemia, malaria, uh, uh, hepatitis, all these infectious diseases were categorized to one together and called bad blood. And they knew they had bad blood. But they were told that they would receive some treatment, but they did not understand it. Did you see them every year? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they come every year. Yeah, every year. I don't know. Why they come? They don't, they don't tell you nothing. They just tell you, we'll come and roll your sleeve up. <laughs> you'll get some blood. From the beginning of the study, uh, the subjects were deceived, and this is where the uh, moral and ethical uh, problems arose because the subjects were not told that they were part of the of an experiment. Well, informed consent was not the vogue in those days. Uh, they were told, I am told that they were told what the study was all about. They were promised certain things, but uh, Informed consent was just not the custom at the time. Investigative reports will return in a moment here on A&E. In 1933, a year after the inception of the Tuskegee syphilis study, the program's director made a fateful decision. Raymond von der Leer was the newly appointed director of the Venereal Disease Division of the Public Health Service. He decided to extend the study to the death of the participants. Once the doctors started examining the men, they discovered a uh, pathology that fascinated them. Raymond von der Leer, Tolliver Clark, and others uh, wrote letters in which they talked about perfect gold mines of cardiovascular syphilis. Once they uh, became mesmerized by this pathology, they did not want to end the experiment, and consequently they looked for ways to keep the experiment going. The patients, still unaware that they carried syphilis, were now to be kept under observation for life. The role of Nurse Rivers, the main contact, became critical. For 40 years, 
she became a friend to the men and their families. The women got mad because they couldn't go. They were sick too. Now whether whatever good that came out of it, I don't know what, whether it really felt good, but they enjoyed having somebody to come all the way from Washington or Atlanta down here and spend two weeks riding up and down the streets, looking at them, listening to the heart and telling them about the heart, their blood pressure and this kind of thing. They just enjoyed it. That was as much help to them as a dose of medicine. And they enjoyed that. You loved her? Yes, sir. All of us. We called her Nurse Rivers. All of us called her Nurse Rivers. And any time you met her, you met her with a smile. And so, it's one of those things. Mm. Then those people that died, those patients that died, they started, it was a fellow, first night I remember dying, Rubbish Creek here, named Mark Yarbo, died up there. Then they started, and, uh, Ludie Payne, I can name any number of them. You know, you know, they started dying, they just died right on out. Andrew Swint, Buster Swint, oh, what a number of them. Then my daddy-in-law was in it. And I'm trying to think the year he died. But they gave the family $35 on his barrel. That's the first time knowing the thing about $35. The families were offered a small cash payment for a burial in exchange for permission to conduct an autopsy. The doctors wanted to discover what damage the syphilis had done. Securing autopsies on the men now became a top priority of the study. They took some of the brain and they took the heart. Those are the two areas that we wanted to know most about. Were there problems getting people to agree to autopsies? Not really, because these people feel very strongly about decent burial. And it, so what we did by assuring them that they could have a decent burial because we were going to pay the undertakers, uh, and they knew that, what they, that one of the reasons for getting the autopsy was to pay for this thing. By the late 1930s and early 40s, large numbers of men on the study were dying. Public Health Service documents show that the death rate of those in the study was now twice that of the non-syphilitic black population of Macon County. The documents indicate that their average life expectancy was already eight years less. Nurse Rivers would attend the funerals of the men uh, when they died. Uh, she would sit in the amen section uh, with, with the families. Uh, often she would reach out and take the hand of, of a widow and hold that hand uh, and, and comfort the person. Uh, at, that, at that very uh, sad moment. Uh, everyone would cry, Nurse Rivers would cry. Uh, and at the end of that ceremony, uh, she would ask the widow or the next to kin for permission to perform an autopsy. And she made that a personal issue. She would ask it as a favor. She said to the widow, uh, I need for you to do something for me, darling. You don't have to do it. But uh, it, would, it would help the government doctors. They need to find out what what, what killed your husband. And maybe uh, if we find out what killed him, we can help other people. So would you do it for me, darling? And she'd put it just like that. She'd make it a personal appeal. The autopsies were performed at the John Andrew Hospital on the campus of Tuskegee Institute, one of the most prestigious black colleges in the South. The hospital is now closed. For the white doctors, Nurse Rivers was a vital link with the black families. I said, this is just like an operation, except the person is dead. Yes, ma'am. I said, now, nobody will know that that body has been open, has been operated on, unless you tell them. I said, because I'm not going to tell them. And this is the way I would get, get the autopsies. And I would I'd put it down to Dr. Peters and all the... <laughs> People who asked that, I'm gonna tell you this one thing. If you don't mess up that body, you won't get another one. <laughs> the men actually informally called themselves the Nurse Rivers Burial Society because in that community, the black in poverty and so on, uh, the 
ceremony of death, the dignified burial, was one of the landmarks in the, the lifetime of an individual. So they, they knew they had syphilis. They knew they were part of Nurse River, the study, what was going on, and uh, they were pleased. In fact, uh, they got the sense of pride in being part of Nurse River's society. I cannot allow myself to obey the fact that she knew what those people treat, were treating us for and didn't tell us. She didn't. You can't believe that she knew. Uh, it's hard for me to, to, to try to fathom and understand as to why that she would have kept that from us. If, we, if she loved us as much as we loved her, how can I see? The study could not have been done without her, period. It wouldn't have been done without her because she was the, the link that kept it going. Do you think part of that link was the fact that she, she was the one who had to mislead people? Oh, I doubt that she misled anybody. I really do. Her, I, I'm sure that she felt she wanted to help everybody. And I'm sure that she felt that we were not hurting anybody, or she wouldn't have been involved. Is, is that your feeling as well? Yes, it is. I don't think we hurt anybody. chain of infection. It was discovered in the late 30s that large doses of arsenic given continuously over a short period would help cure syphilis. Large-scale treatment programs were set up in the South. In Macon County, Nurse Rivers was attached to the rapid treatment centers to make sure none of the participants in the study inadvertently received treatment. The Public Health Service had uh, started a massive screening to find people who had syphilis and an even more massive roundup to try to get them in uh, to hotel rooms for three and five and ten days so they could undergo these long-term massive injections of arsenic compounds. And I recall one participant, one uh, person testifying at the Senate hearings telling about how he was pulled out of a treatment group, lied to, and sent on the bus back from Montgomery, Alabama, the capital, to Tuskegee to be a part of the study and to not be treated. They said I had to go, but they were wrong. I didn't know it until I got there. I know it until, until the next morning, that over, that over that and over in the night. Well, about day, a nurse ran through the crowd and said, I'm Oh, she was small in stature. She said, I've been looking for a man here pra practically all night. I'm not supposed to be here. Oh, she was for me near that tree. About, about this near that tree. And she said, uh, his name is Herman Shaw. When she said his name is Herman Shaw, I stood up. I said, my name is Herman Shaw. She said, what? I said, my name is Herman Shaw. She said, come here, come here. What you doing up here? They put me on the bus and told me to come up here. See, you ain't got no business. You supposed to be in you supposed to be, you you in that Macon County clinic. You're not supposed to be here. And then she got me up and got me in a taxi, a cab, and put me on the bus and sent me to Towson. I came on. So they took you out of the treatment line? Yes, sir. Uh, out of treatment in, in that building there where they where they would is where they're getting treated towards taking treatment. Bad blood will return in a moment here on a &E. In the 1940s, the discovery that penicillin cured syphilis brought the nationwide epidemic to an end. But the participants in the Tuskegee syphilis study, who had never been told they had syphilis, were not informed that there was now an effective treatment. Penicillin 
kill the spirochete of syphilis. It looks like good news. News promising enough to risk making medicine's only conclusive test. Volunteers are searched for. Volunteers with syphilis who could be promised nothing. It was good news. The discovery of penicillin was also a critical turning point for the mission of the experiment. Now the doctors move to actually safeguard the infection in their patients. Once penicillin became available in large quantities after World War II, the government launched a massive drive to eliminate the disease. Penicillin uh, changed the whole picture because the main reason we wanted to do the study in the first place was we didn't expect penicillin and the treatment we had was probably just as bad or worse than the disease. But in a way, it's unfortunate because when you get a treatment as good as penicillin, you stop thinking about the disease and we stop studying it. And we don't learn anything. We just treat, treat. And that's what happens with these latents. That people say, what the heck, why should I worry about it? Give them another shot of penicillin. Despite the availability of penicillin, the public health service in the late 40s and 50s continued its attempts to prevent participants in the study from receiving treatment. With the backing of the U.S. Surgeon General, they contacted local draft boards and asked them to excuse participants from military service, as all new draftees would be screened and treated for syphilis if found to be infected. The draft boards complied, despite the fact that it was a state law in Alabama that anyone identified as having syphilis must receive treatment. In the early 50s, as mobility increased and some of the participants moved away to the industrial cities of the north, public health service offices across the country were asked to track down participants to ensure that they would be kept within the study. They were asked in particular to make sure full autopsies were carried out on those who died. In an internal memorandum of 1952, a senior public health service surgeon wrote, all of us who are working with the Tuskegee Project are looking to the pathology results to give us the key answers. If we may sound a little grim, we might say that we are looking forward to a rich harvest of some 200 autopsies in the next five to 10 years. In 1952, the government doctors reviewed the study for the first time in light of the discovery of penicillin. You were uh, involved with this study at about the time that penicillin became available and could have been used, and, and a decision was made to withhold it. H how do you feel about that? Well, I, I agree with the decision for this reason. By the time penicillin, in the proper form to treat those people under those circumstances, was available to everybody, they were latent for at least 25 years. And as one of the old timers said, if a patient has had syphilis for 25 years, you don't treat them, you congratulate them. In other words, any complications of the disease would have shown up by then. And there's no evidence that giving penicillin at that time would have undone any of the complications that were already there. The controversy about whether penicillin cured latent syphilis went on for several years, but that controversy was certainly resolved in terms of a public health service policy by 1953, when the public health service uh, took an official position that uh, penicillin was an effective treatment, not just for early syphilis, but uh, latent syphilis as well. And you, again, can't defend not treating those people at that time. If that was the official, formal position of the U.S. Public Health Service, then that's what they should have done, but they didn't. My first encounter with this Tuskegee study was after I came back here and was in practice, I had an old man in the hospital that needed penicillin for some reason. I suspect that he had pneumonia, but I honestly can't remember. But when I ordered intravenous penicillin for him, one of the older nurses, who happened to be black, said, 
but Dr. Sturr, you shouldn't give this man penicillin. And I said, why? Does he, is he allergic to penicillin? Said, no, sir, but he is one of Nurse Rivers' patients. And I said, what's that got to do with anything? Said, well, I don't think you should give him penicillin. I said, well, why not? Tell me why not or give him the penicillin. Said, well, I think you ought to call the health department. So I called the health department, and it was late in the day. No one was there. So I went ahead and treated the man with penicillin. To continue life at all costs, sometimes you have to do research to advance the vanguard, the mystique, to understand how we had keep life going at all cost in the larger sense of the public health. In terms of the individual, yes. Does the individual get lost in that milieu? Get lost as an, uh, a cipher? Does it get lost? We try not to, but in research sometimes that happens and we must not let that happen. What they were doing, I didn't know what to what admit mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. I have to look at it now. Back there, there. It didn't mean me no good, what they were doing. Mm -hmm. I'll just come get my blood and go on off somewhere with it. I don't know what they done to it. Does it make you angry now? Mm -mm. No, not there. Not now. Do you think the doctors were evil men? Yes, sir. I know they were. What makes you say that? Because, you see, I lived through it, and there, there are people who read about it. But those are people who read about it, they read about it. Those, that lived, those of us who went through it, we didn't know about it. Hmm. And no, it's not a good feeling, I'll be fair with you. You can't go around hating, cannot go around hating people, but it's not a good feeling. Do you hate them? Well, no, sir. I don't hate them. But um, I'm like my daddy said. He said he wasn't above any human flesh, but he was against the way some people abuse that flesh. And so I'm trying to think it, it's kind of complicated. Opelika, a mostly white town 10 miles down the road from Tuskegee, 1992. To me in the South, at least in this town, blacks don't have respect, okay? They don't care what they do. Yeah, they don't turn blinkers on to turn to turn the corner. They don't. Um, they don't care if you're behind them wanting to go straight and they're talking on somebody on a hill. They don't care. You know, they just they just don't. They're walking across the road and you're half a block away. They they won't speed up to go across the road. They'll just keep on doing. You know, they'll just keep on walking. Um, they just don't have respect for other humans. The Tuskegee study took place against a background of racial prejudice that survives to this day in Alabama. For the men in the study, racism was an accepted fact of life. Was it a racist study? Absolutely not. There is no racist uh, involved in this. But you could legislate that, but it is not true, okay? Um, it was, uh, it was done in, in rural Alabama, in Macon County. It was done in blacks. It was done in, in, a, high, in a society in which 35% of the community had syphilis uh, initially. 
That's why they placed the study. It was done in blacks because they were non-mobile and they knew that they would stay in rural Alabama and they could follow them more carefully. Uh, in that sense, uh, racist, yes, but in the most benign appropriation of the term. America's understanding of racism and equality was radically altered by the civil rights movement of the 1960s. But as we'll see when bad blood continues, it would take years for those changes to help the study participants in Macon County, Alabama. Bad Blood will return in a moment here on A&E. The Tuskegee syphilis study, an experiment in which mostly white doctors permitted and then carefully maintained illness in their black patients, could not have taken place without certain fundamental assumptions about the different rights of racial groups in America. During the 1960s, the civil rights movement upset many of those assumptions by demanding equal treatment before the law, especially in the South. Blacks transformed the social context in which the Tuskegee study had been conceived. In the mid-60s, Peter Buxton was a junior official in the Public Health Service in San Francisco. I complained as a public citizen, irrespective of being an employee of the Public Health Service, I complained saying that I thought that this was no longer a moral thing to be doing and that the entire good work of the Public Health Service might easily be called into question by people stumbling across this study and using it for inflammatory purposes instead of looking at the entire picture and trying to get the right result out of it. My reactions were that uh, the, an attempt should be made to uh, explain to him why the study had started, what was being done, what the character, character of, the, of the people involved were, and um, uh, I think this is what was done um, at that time. I've, never, I've not met uh, Mr. Buxton, so I, I don't know, but I think that it was our, our we made an effort to, to try and, and present the facts to him. There was a dead silence from the Communicable Disease uh, Center in Atlanta, and after a month and a half or thereabouts, a bureaucrat came on leave, ordinary leave, and came to interview me and see what this odd person in San Francisco was trying to accomplish. Was I a lunatic, or had I found something that they didn't understand? No one was complacent about this study. We were very much concerned about it. Um, one of the scientific points was, if you're going to start a study, complete it, uh, don't ab uh, abort it. Also, too, I think that they don't know how to end it. Um, uh, uh. If they end it, they would have to offer some explanation to the men because the men had been told always that the experiment would keep going that they would continue to treat them. And I think part of uh, not ending it is that there's no good explanation that they can come up with before ending it. These were people who had been in the study then by, for 35, 36 years, and uh, we felt we had an obligation to at least continue uh, what uh, benefits had been uh, offered to them. Against a background of criticism from within the Public Health Service, the doctors met in Atlanta in 1969 to decide whether the experiment should continue. They discussed the possibility of treating the survivors, but after due consideration, they decided that the experiment should go on. Well, I don't think that I uh, personally uh uh, was committing an atrocity. I think I was doing what, uh, given the information that we had at the present time, was a, a scientifically uh, sound judgment. I think politically it was uh, uh, you know, probably a mistake. Thoughtlessness, thoughtlessness, thoughtlessness. 
many of these physician investigators were trained in the importance of advancing the frontiers of knowledge. And that became their primary goal. And, and in, in that quest, they forgot that they uh, were subjecting human beings to considerable harm. They just hadn't faced up to it. Yes. They paid us. Trying to figure the year. And all the living participants got the same thing. $32,550.20. The Tuskegee study was finally ended in 1972, following exposure in the press. Lawyers acting for the men filed a suit for damages against the U.S. government. The government settled out of court for $10 million to be divided among the survivors and relatives of those who had died. And the survivors were given free medical care for life. How are you doing today, Mr. Sinclair? Yeah. Right. Have you had any problems since your last visit? Yeah, I think I'm going to look at what's going Gouch. Gouch. Where is that? In the knee, the foot, the ankle? Right back here. I think we're going to need to uh, do a, a blood test for that today and see about the gout. Okay. And I, I think that it was a mistake, and I think that uh, the the federal government uh, has a guilty conscience about it, and I think that rightly so. Uh, I treated a number of these patients and still have a few who were in the study, and the federal government has such a guilty conscience that they will buy them a 10-speed bicycle if I say it's medically necessary. I got $32,500. I got enough finish paying for my house. <laughs> Do you know why they gave you the money? Mm -hmm. I, never, I never really understood. But it was all right. They could do that again. I wouldn't thought I would. <laughs> <laughs> and they could do it again. You wouldn't fall out with them. I wouldn't fall out with Appreciate me. Cooperating with them, I think, for 25 years. That's what, that's all I can get out of it. They appreciate me cooperating with them for 25 years. That's what they sent me. For generations, the story of Black Americans has been woven with threads of resilience and struggle, marked by a history of oppression that continues to cast a long shadow. Among the numerous injustices faced, few examples exemplify the betrayal of trust, quite like the Tuskegee experiment. This dark chapter not only reflects systemic racism within medical research, but also highlights the urgent need for accountability and reform in how marginalized communities are treated. The Tuskegee experiment, officially known as the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male, 
began in 1932 and continued for 40 years. Conducted by the U.S. Public Health Service, it aimed to study the progression of untreated syphilis in black men in rural Alabama. The participants, almost 400 impoverished African-American men, were misled into believing they were receiving free medical care for bad blood. In reality, they were denied treatment for syphilis, even after penicillin became a widely accepted cure in the 1940s. This egregious violation of ethics and humanity was not just a failure of medical practice. It was a manifestation of a broader societal disregard for black lives. The motivations behind the Tuskegee experiment were rooted in deeply entrenched racial stereotypes and systemic racism. The men involved were seen as subjects rather than human beings, their lives reduced to data points in a so-called scientific study. This reflects a historical narrative in which black bodies have often been exploited, objectified, and dehumanized. The belief that black individuals could endure pain and suffering without the same empathy extended to white individuals reveals an insidious racism that permeated both society and science. The consequences of the Tuskegee experiment were devastating, not only for the men involved, but for their families and communities. Many of the participants suffered severe health complications, and the stigma associated with syphilis further alienated them from their communities. The generational trauma inflicted by this experiment continues to reverberate, fostering distrust in medical institutions that persist today. Many Black Americans still grapple with the repercussions of such betrayals, leading to hesitancy in seeking medical care and participating in research studies. This reluctance is a direct response to a history that has shown time and again that Black lives are often expendable in the eyes of systemic power. In the wake of the Tuskegee experiment, significant changes were made to research ethics and regulations, particularly with the establishment of institutional review boards, IRBs, and the requirement for informed consent. However, the underlying issues of racism and exploitation in medical research remain unresolved. The legacy of Tuskegee serves as a stark reminder of the need for ongoing vigilance in ensuring that the rights and dignity of all individuals, particularly those from marginalized communities, are respected and upheld. In recent years, there has been a growing awareness of health disparities affecting Black Americans, exacerbated by socioeconomic factors, systemic racism, and inadequate access to health care. The recent pandemic laid bare these inequalities, with Black communities disproportionately affected by the virus. This current crisis is a call to action, urging society to confront the systemic issues that perpetuate these disparities. Moving forward, it is crucial to amplify the voices of Black individuals in discussions about health care and medical research. Acknowledging past wrongs is essential, but it is equally important to foster a future where Black lives are not only valued, but actively prioritized in medical and scientific endeavors. Trust can only be rebuilt through transparency, accountability, and a genuine commitment to equity. The story of the Tuskegee experiment is not just a historical footnote. It is a critical part of understanding the ongoing struggle against oppression and injustice faced by Black Americans. It calls upon all of us to reflect on our roles in perpetuating or dismantling these systems. True healing requires confronting uncomfortable truths and committing to a future where equity in healthcare is a reality, not a dream. The legacy of Tuskegee must serve as both a warning and a guide, illuminating the path toward justice, respect, and dignity for all.